Hi, everyone. Thanks for joining this virtual presentation of using specs for code gen given at API Days Paris in uh, December 2023. So to briefly introduce myself, my name is Nolan Damari Sullivan. I'm the head of developer relations at Speakeasy, where I'm working to make it possible for every organization to give their API a first class developer experience. Uh, specifically, that takes the form of SDK and documentation creation. Before working at Speakeasy, I used to be in charge of product for LiveRamp's API platform. So as I mentioned, I'm going to be talking about CodeGen today. CodeGen is something that most people are using their open API spec today, but if you're just getting started, there are a few tips and tricks that I'm going to show you that will spare you a lot of pain on your journey. Um, and you know, just to start, this is kind of typical of most companies' journey through using an open API spec. It's the I call it the Pooh Bear Open API Sophistication Scale. Uh, it starts off with maintaining an open API spec because it's been mandated by the leadership team. Um, it's a pain in the neck. It's not really something that people want to do. They're not deriving any value from it. Um, but you know, someone read that it was important to have an open API spec and it gets mandated to the engineering organization. Then at some point, people will realize that, well, if we're maintaining this thing, we might as well make it valuable. And usually the first application of the open API spec is for keeping documentation up to date. So the open API spec is a reference of your API, and that can be used to create the classic three panel documentation site that you've probably seen when you're trying to get started using an API. So that, that's kind of the phase two. And to be honest, that's where a lot of companies are probably at today. Um, now there's a further stage of sophistication, which is where people should be trying to get to, and it's where the most advanced engineering organizations are today, uh, which is using your open API spec to build libraries that power internal and external development. Uh, and said another way, this is about using your open API spec to create SDKs. Um, some people will create even more code from their open API spec. They could be using it to create server stubs, um, but typically you're gonna see it used for client libraries. And that would just allows people to access your API using the language that they're most familiar with and spares them having to write a lot of the boilerplate code uh, that makes integrating with APIs a pain in the neck today. And that, you know, that'll be, that'll help you convert more customers in, or more users into paying users. Uh, and it'll give them a better all experience when they're using their product, which means that they're more likely to maximize usage in the long term. So at the end of the day, it's all about uh, driving revenue, driving higher customer satisfaction. Okay, so how come people aren't all using their spec for code gen? Uh, if we can agree that this is you know, desirable and is gonna be better for your business. Well, there's a common set of problems that I'm gonna be walking through, uh, which are things that we've seen that have prevented people from being able to achieve that higher plane of DevX for their API. The first category is the organizational pitfalls. And I'm gonna talk through how you can kind of short circuit some of those. So this is probably the most common one. And it goes something like this. We can't use our spec for code gen because we don't have the right level of staffing and we haven't built a sophisticated enough governance workflow. Uh, and this is usually the case if you know people say, oh, we can't use this spec because it's actually not super well maintained. Um, you know, it gets out of date, et cetera, et cetera. And in terms of the solution, I actually think for this, it's just, just do it anyway. Um, you know, I think that if you're waiting around to build a governance workflow before you start delivering value, you're basically never gonna, you're never gonna get there because it's a bit of a chicken and egg problem. Like until you're, you're creating some sort of value with the spec, it's not valuable for the spec to be maintained, right? Like you're not gonna get developers to contribute to 
your open API spec and making sure that it's up to date if you're not creating some kind of value for the business or for them. And that's kind of exactly what CodeGen does. If you're able to generate libraries off of your open API spec and the developers within your organization are able to use those libraries and it makes their lives better, now you've created an incentive for them to make sure that those specs stay up to date and have the latest information. Um, so yeah, it seems kind of counterintuitive, uh, but you know, doing even starting small, doing code gen, creating a library that you know covers one API, and maybe you just maintain it manually in the beginning, that just starts to get the ball rolling. It shows people that you know there is a better future that they can work towards, and that'll create kind of the buy-in that you need from the rest of the organization. Um, to start maintaining the spec. Okay, so this is going to be the bulk of the session. I wanted this to just be really tactical. Um, so this is going to be about common pitfalls that people run into when they're actually writing their spec and how you can avoid them. Okay, so one thing when you're writing your spec that you're going to want to pay attention to if you plan on using it for Cogen is operation IDs. Operation IDs are these unique values that get added to each operation or each method in the spec. Um, because they're, if you're not using CodeGen, they're not really used for anything. It's just supposed to be this unique identifier. So I've seen people you go so far as to just give these like a SHA-256 hash just to ensure that it's unique. Um, and that kind of makes sense, but if you're doing if you're doing code gen, any kind of code gen, it's probably going to be be the case that the operation ID gets used to create some sort of a method name. Uh, and so, you know, while a SHA-256 hash is really great for ensuring uniqueness, it's really poor if it's going to be used as a method name. Um, so, you know, a good piece of advice is if you're going to be doing code gen, uh, just make sure that it's human readable and is descriptive of what the operation is used for. Uh, make sure that you follow a consistent pattern across your spec. Basically, always true for API development. You always want to be consistent. Uh, finally, just stick to alphanumerics and simple separators, so a dash or an underscore. If you follow those three things, you're probably going to avoid like 90% of the problems uh, that you can run into. Um, and this is just an example of a pattern that I like to follow, which is verb underscore object, which, for example, if you were had a drinks endpoint and this was like a get request, you might call it list underscore drinks. Uh, and I guess one final note here, uh, one, of the, one of the places where this becomes a problem is if people are actually generating their spec from their API code base using a tool like Fast API or Express or you know whatever your framework of choice is. Uh, and a lot of the times I've seen that those frameworks and the open API generation that comes baked in tends to generate these names that are a little bit ugly. You'll often see things like get underscore drinks underscore V1 underscore get underscore, um, you know, speakeasy. Uh, and again, it's unique, which is great, but it is not a great, experience for a user if it becomes the method name that's um, they're going to be referencing. So yeah, to shorten that, keep it tight, keep it simple, and you can't go wrong. Okay, so moving on, and you can follow along in the image on the right if you kind of want to see this change and how it impacts the code in action. Um, but another, probably the biggest thing you can do besides operation IDs is reuse component schemas wherever possible and make sure that you're not using inline schemas. Um, this is another one where if you're generating your spec from code, you're probably going to be, it's probably going to be creating inline schemas by default. Um, usually you need to add some sort of special annotation in your framework if you want the type to become shared. Uh, most of them do have it. So it's just a question of kind of looking at the documentation. And we do have some guides uh, that I can, I can link to later that walk through some of the popular frameworks and how to, how to make these optimizations. Um, so in CodeGen, so if you're doing CodeGen off of your open API spec, typically component schemas are gonna become your shared types. Um, so 
yeah, I mean, why is that valuable? You know, having shared types using component schemas, you're going to get easier maintenance of your open API spec. Uh, it's going to vastly improve the readability of the spec, you know, rather than having to look at this big nested uh, object that's sitting under the API operation. Um, you'll usually have something nice and descriptive, like in this case, uh, we've got hashtag components schemas drink, and that makes it pretty clear what exactly is being returned by that API endpoint. All right, next one. This is a pretty simple one, but using tags to group resources in code generation that's being done off of your spec, tags are typically going to be used to group methods into namespaces. Um, so, you know, just keep that in mind. I have seen instances like this comes up if people are maybe using their spec for documentation. I've seen cases where there will be tags that aren't really related to the resources that are in the API, but instead are things like maybe an alpha label or a beta label, um, something that's indicating some kind of, um, just some sort of indication of the stability of the API. Um, but, you know, obviously that's gonna be a problem if you're, if you're using your spec to create an SDK. Uh, you really want these to be referencing the different resources that can be manipulated. So yeah, you know, to be have effective use, first of all, you know, use them. Uh, if you don't use them, typically you're gonna have all your methods just be lumped under one base class, uh, which is not as good of a user experience for people that are trying to use your client libraries. Uh, and yeah, that's, as I said, just have a tag for each of the high level resources that your API exposes. And yeah, another thing that I've seen just Think carefully before you associate a method to multiple tags. Generally speaking, you don't want to have the same API operation appearing under multiple resources. That's only going to kind of confuse your library users. Um, there could definitely be valid use cases for it, but usually not the case. It's usually unintentional. So yeah, generally try to make it so that each operation in the spec is associated to one tag. Um, and as I mentioned, make sure it doesn't conflict with your doc site. I'm gonna have a little bit later on about how to handle instances where workflows have conflicts, but yeah, understand how you're using tags uh, and how that appears in your doc site. Okay, next one is error codes. This is pretty common. I would actually say this often is the case when people are maintaining something by hand. Um, people will not mark down the error responses in the open API schema. They'll only ever record the information for the 200. Uh, and that is that is great. But the reality is, is that people are going to run into errors when they're using their API. That's pretty inevitable. Uh, in a lot of cases, you know, the how you fail can be more important than than how you succeed, right? Like failing gracefully is really important if you're trying to craft a good developer experience for your API. So, you know, if you want to, if you want to have this be effective, then first thing is just to use them. A lot of people don't, and it's going to be frustrating if people are running into error codes. Um, next thing I would say is it's not that hard to add them. Really all you need to do is define a component schema for each of the error responses that your API will return. And then you can just go and you can basically add, you can just go and reference those responses in each of the endpoints. And it really becomes like an exercise in copy and paste to be completely honest. So it's not super difficult. Yeah, and lastly, you know, the, the more you enumerate the better. I would, you know, don't just try and have exhaustive coverage of all of the error types that your API can, can return. Uh, and make sure those are all listed out in the spec. Okay. And this is the last one, and this is really kind of a case of like inside baseball, uh, but it is something that I see that appears really common in open API specs. I think this is because of uh, some of the tools, like the popular tools out there, like um, Stoplight, I think, for example, will make use of any of. And it's it's not really their fault. Um, any of is completely valid and, and does have a lot of use cases. If you're thinking about things from 
a validation perspective, but when it comes to code gen, any of is kind of nonsensical. And the reason being is because any of is, is kind of saying, you're going to have a list of objects in your spec and then there'll be an any of, and basically what you're saying is uh, any of the following objects could be relevant for this endpoint. Um, but any of also kind of implies at least one of. Uh, so it could be that it's one or more of the following objects. And in a cogen perspective, that becomes really hard to actually do effectively because you would need to, to do, to actually do it the way that it's described in the spec, you would need to have a permutation of basically the entire list of possible objects. So if you had, you know, a drinks object and it was any of um, cocktail, mocktail, beer, wine, blah, 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 you basically have to enumerate all of the possible combinations. Uh, and that leads to a lot of code bloat. Um, and that's why most code generators won't support the any of keyword. And my tip for effective use is if the intention is that you want to generate a union type, which is to say it's either going to be this or it's going to be this, then you should just use one of in your spec. And in code generation, that's going to be able to be handled. Um, and in terms of the clarity of your spec, I don't think you're really going to be sacrificing anything. Um, so yeah, just take a look at your spec, especially if you're using something like Stoplight um, to generate it. Just make sure any of isn't in use and that you're using one of. Okay, so yeah, this is just a quick summary. Uh, make your operation IDs human readable. Use component schemas wherever possible. Use your tags to group resources. Uh, include error responses for all of the possible errors that your API may return and use one of instead of any of. Okay, so that was kind of like the, some of the common pitfalls that we see in the spec. Um, these are some less common pitfalls uh, that I did want to quickly go through. And the first one is overcoming spec fragility. Uh, the problem as it'll be expressed by people is, I don't know what's going to happen if I edit this spec. Uh, I'm not completely sure what workflows are running off of this and what the requirements of those workflows are. Um, and that is pretty common for larger, older organizations. And so when the time comes where they say, okay, I do want to do, I do want to do code gen. I want to start creating SDKs off my open API spec. Um, but then the question becomes, how do I optimize my spec for this new use case without breaking any of the existing workflows that might be running. And again, there could be like an unknown number of those workflows. And I think that overlays is a really good way to solve this problem. So as to what an overlay is, it's basically a file that lives alongside your spec. And it just specifies a list of edits that you want to make to the open API specification. So you basically save this list of manipulations that are going to be made to your canonical spec. Um, and you can feed that into the new workflow. So if you're spinning up an SDK's workflow, uh, that workflow can pull your existing open API spec. And then it can also pull these overlays. Uh, and those overlays, that overlay file can basically contain the edits that you would have wanted to make to your spec to optimize it for the code generation. And so that way you're basically changing your spec without actually needing to make changes to the spec, which the existing workflows are using. And that way you can kind of have your cake and eat it too. Uh, you can you know, have a workflow running that's producing SDKs uh, without having to worry about breaking any of the existing workflows. Cool. And yeah, last one, this one, you know, I would say proceed with extreme caution, but basically there, there are cases where, and this again is usually older organizations, but it can be the case that the, the actual structure of the API um, that's been defined and therefore the open API spec, it doesn't actually translate to how you want users to use the API. Again, that could be because you know the API is fairly old, um, things have evolved in a way that wasn't originally anticipated and 
yeah, there's basically, you need like, the way that people are gonna be actually using the API doesn't align with the publicly defined interface. Um, and, you know, code generation, I mentioned it because code generation and kind of creating libraries can certainly massage the edges of this problem uh, without you needing to kind of do a complete rebuild of your API, which in some cases can be not feasible. So, you know, I would say certainly proceed with caution, but there is a specification called the workflow specific specification, which you may have heard, you may hear uh, Frank Kilcomans talk about uh, at a, one of the other API days, Paris talks, but those can, that specification can certainly help. Uh, and so if this is the problem that you're facing, I would point you towards uh, that extra specification as a potential solution. Cool. And in terms of tools that you can use for code gen, um, so obviously, you know, I work for Speakeasy. Speakeasy is one tool that you can potentially use. Um, I would also suggest that people check out the open source solutions that exist. There's the OSS generators project, uh, and that can certainly be a worthwhile solution. Um, and if you're looking for a full list, there is a site called Open API Tools, which has a list of all of the different code generators that are out there. Cool. And this is where you can find me. Feel free to shoot me an email if you want to talk about, you know, Cogen, SDKs, anything APIs and open API. Um, and if you're coming to API Days Paris, then, you know, feel free to try and find me outside. Thanks so much.